Welcome back. Mark Farzetta in for Jody McDonald. And now joining us from legal hands to the face, our man Bill Calarulo joining us. What's up, Bill? What's going on, Farzi? How you doing, brother? I, I'm doing excellent, man. Looking forward to working with you for the next 90 minutes. We will be joined by Derek Gunn. He'll be joining us at uh, 920. Give us a preview of Sports Take coming up, of course, at noon and talking all things Eagles with us. Bill, uh, what's on your mind today regarding those birds, man? What, what, what's popping? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think Eagles today? I'm still just frustrated that it took this long to get some depth at that linebacker position. <laughs> really? I, I, I've been I've been preaching it all summer long since they let TJ Edwards and Kazir White walk that they had to do something. I mean, I know we're all hopeful N'Kobe Dean's going to be the guy he was at Georgia, but this is a guy who's played 34 snaps in the NFL, Farzee, 34 snaps. He's got 13 career tackles. And we're putting all of this on his shoulders this year. You had to bring in some depth. I mean, you, you see what's happening with him having this ankle injury. Miles Jack's already getting first team reps. It, it's crazy that it took this long to get some depth there, but I'm happy they did. I just don't know how much Jack and Cunningham have left in the tank. That's all. So, so obviously, everyone is anticipating some kind of move. Uh, Nick Sirianni even said himself during the press conference that this isn't. You know, he said, "Oh yeah, you know, we need to we need some more bodies in that room." But he said everything's a competition. That's one of their core values. To quote him, it's one of their core values: competition. Is there real competition now for the you know really any linebacker spot, including the Kobe Deans? And I usually don't take a lot of stock in what they say. I like to look at what they do. And if you look at the deals they gave Cunningham and Jack, they're paying them double what they were paying Nicholas Morrow. So they go out early in the offseason. They bring in Nicholas Morrow on a one-year deal. They're only paying Morrow $1.15 million. They give Jack and Cunningham identical deals. Each are getting $2.5 million each. So they're paying them more than double what they're paying Morrow. So I do think they're hopeful – these guys are going to come in and compete for that off-the-ball linebacker spot because I don't know how much confidence they have in Nicholas Morrow. He's a guy Chicago clearly thought they were upgrading when they brought on T.J. Edwards. They're paying T.J. Edwards a lot of money to be their new linebacker, and they let Morrow walk. So I don't know what the Eagles are going to do. I'm just – the positive here, I don't want to be all doom and gloom this morning. The positive is you got to hope that that defensive line, especially that interior of that defensive line, is so damn good that me or you could be making tackles back there. I mean, that's what we have to hope happens. Mm. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's not get too cocky on that one. Uh, <laughs> I still got people that will uh, text me about a freshman football game I played against LaSalle allowing two touchdowns, man. I still haven't forgiven myself for it. Um, but uh, looking at this defense as a whole, Sean Desai obviously taking the reins here. Uh, we just had this conversation with John McMullen. It, it seems like this Eagles team, whether it's Howie Roseman or whether it's Nick Sirianni uh, himself, Everything seems to always have their fingerprints on it with Howie Roseman, though. Uh, what are we to expect? I always feel like the outline of the defense is set by Nick Sirianni. This is what I like my defense to do. In today's NFL, you can't be as aggressive as you maybe once were by being able to send someone that you rather have in coverage after the quarterback or trying to get into the backfield to try to disrupt something. That aggression doesn't exist for most teams, especially it doesn't exist with the Philadelphia Eagles, albeit all the sacks they got last year. That was mostly from your four-man front, making sure that they won their one-on-one -on -one battles. Now, also a guy like Asan Reddick won his battles on the edge. You were able to overload on one side occasionally and make sure that he could take advantage of going around a guy like Brandon Graham, for instance. So what do you expect from Sean Desai's defense in terms of anything that might be different than what you saw under Jonathan Gannon? I'm sure he'll have some wrinkles he'll add in, but I think you're going to see a very similar defense to what we saw from Jonathan Gannon. They both come from that Vic Fangio school of bend but don't break. Don't Like you said, you're not very aggressive in today's NFL. These quarterbacks are too good that they can beat you when you bring too many players. I know Desai said in his initial interview with the media he wants – he wants teams to be able to feel this defense. He said all the right things because we in Philadelphia love that aggressive defense that's going to hit and blitz and do all these things. But I don't think you're going to see a lot of it. I think it's going to be a very similar type of defense where they're going to try to get there with their front four, occasionally bring somebody, but I think it's going to be a very similar defense. One of the wrinkles we have seen so far in training camp is a lot of this three safety look. You didn't see a lot of that last year with Jonathan Gannon. I don't know how much they're going to use it, but it's something they've been experimenting with on that defense. Partially, I think, because of the 
weakness at our linebacker position. There's not a lot of depth there, so maybe they're looking to see how to bring in three safeties, but that's also another position that we have question marks on, You know, losing both starters from last year. But I think Sean Desai will have to see how he approaches this season, but from everything that I'm reading and watching about his prior defenses, it looks like it's going to be fairly similar to Jonathan Gannon. Mm-hmm. And I know Gannon is a very polarizing figure in this town, He did have a good defense last year, but everything that we were concerned about came back to haunt us at the worst possible time in Super Bowl 57, the lack of adjustments, the inability to beat good quarterbacks. That was the main problem is Gannon was so good against average quarterbacks, but once an above average quarterback got a hold of that defense, they seemed to just pick it apart. Mm -hmm. And how dare you say Jonathan Gannon did good or this defense was good? How (laughs) dare you, sir? Um, Look, I know you don't want to be doom and gloom, and I don't want to be doom and gloom either, but you don't sound like you're extremely – now, look, I don't know anyone who's extremely optimistic about the Eagles' linebacking situation right now, linebacker situation right now. Uh, But I am optimistic about N'Kobe Dean. I wouldn't say I'm extremely optimistic. I would say that I am going to buy stock in N'Kobe Dean, not a billion shares or anything like that, but – I look at it like this. I mean, look, you can look at what's been here already, whether it be Alex Singleton, who also signed a nice deal with the Broncos. You mentioned TJ Edwards signing his deal with the uh, with the, with the Bears. The Eagles are investing a third-round pick in a guy that a lot of people thought had better pedigree than a third-round pick. At worst, a second-round pick. He fell all the way to the third round. Uh, I look at it as a guy that will go out there and has, the, has instincts, which will make him react quickly, and then has the quickness and the speed to capitalize on those instincts as well. Not to mention the fact that I think any linebacker with speed and instincts is has a little bit of a break here with who's going to be hitting guys in front of him, who's going to be trying to create push in front of him. And he doesn't know anybody better than he knows Jalen Carter and he knows Jordan Davis. So I think that right there will be a recipe, not for perennial Pro Bowl contention, but at least a, a recipe for some success here at the linebacker spot. Do you see... Any optimism for Nicobe Dean as a regular starter for the next, you know, five to six years at the NFL level here with the Philadelphia Eagles? Yeah, let me be clear, Farzi. I agree with you. I have a okay. lot of optimism when it comes to Nicobe Dean. We saw him do it at the highest level in college in that SEC, playing against the best talent that college football has to offer. And he didn't just play well, he dominated on the best defense we have seen maybe ever in college football. He was the leader of that defense. He dominated from that linebacker position. So I have a lot of optimism. My only concern is is I don't think there is anyone that can say with absolute certainty that a guy who we've only seen play 34 defensive snaps, that we should be putting all of this on his shoulders with really out any depth at that position. So that's why I do think this was a smart move by the Eagles. It reminded me a lot of what they did last year with Ndamukong Sue and Linval Joseph. They brought them in a little bit later, obviously. But bringing in two veterans to hopefully solidify that position. But I just don't understand what took so long. And you know, then, then my concerns, too, were just, well, why are they still available? It's it's August. Why are those guys still available? But N'Kobe Dean, I, am, I don't want to be doom and gloom. I am very optimistic with his intelligence level, with his ability for what, what we saw at Georgia, I think this guy is going to be a stud. What everyone's concerned about is is his size. Now, this injury that he sustained, this ankle injury, seems to be a little bit fluky, but can he withstand a 17-game season at his size from that linebacker position? I hope that he can, but again, these are all question marks of why you need to have depth at that position. Mm-hmm. All right, I want to flip things over and talk a little offense here, and hopefully we can get some optimism going here. Maybe you can settle a debate that John and I were having a little bit here because I'm, I, I, it's, I, I don't want to go to extremes here, and I know a lot of people like to go to extremes right out of the gate, but I feel like there's some kind of happy negotiation here, some kind of happy give and take when it comes to Jalen Hurts and the amount of times he runs. Now, let me just state this. I love Jalen Hurts for the player that he is. I love everything that Jalen Hurts does. But I think it's up to the coaching staff sometimes to save him from himself. Now, we were talking about run pass options versus just straight up run plays. And I remember last year, Nick Sirianni, I forget which game it was after, but Nick Sirianni, when he was asked about it after the, uh, by the media, you know, after Jalen Hurts has had a, a lot of runs in one particular game, he said, you know, maybe we need to take the option away from it and just call straight up runs. That's on me. That's on the coaches. That's, a, that's something that we got to do and make sure we work it in. 
I, I feel like there's a happy medium there where you can actually have him run and manipulate the defense. And I think that's a great thing. And I remember Miles Sanders coming out talking to him uh, after games where Gardner Minshew played or Kenny Gainwell coming out talking after games with Carter Minshew plays about how Jalen Hurts has that impact on the defense to open up running lanes for those running backs. So I don't want to take it away, but I think there is a way to maybe harness it a little bit more, especially when you're talking about the last two seasons with him as your starter. He's missed a, a couple of games in each season. So, I yes, and I know that quarterbacks can get hurt in the pocket as well. But when you look at last year's play against the Bears, it was on a play where he was running to the outside. He wasn't in the pocket. So that's something I want the coaching staff to be a little bit aware of and have kind of a good gauge, a good counter on, okay, this is a little too much of seeing Jalen out there. Maybe this is a play where if we're trying to run, maybe we just hand the ball to a running back. Where are you at on trying to limit a little bit but not completely take away that running ability of Jalen Hurts? I'm a little bit torn on this, and the, and the reason that I'm torn is I agree with you, 165 carries last year in 15 games is a lot for a quarterback, <laughs> yeah. and the year before that, 139 carries, so that's a lot, and he only played 15 games, like you said, because he got injured in both seasons, but my concern about eliminating that is the Eagles offense, that RPO offense, you have to have the threat of the quarterback pulling the ball to be able to take it around the outside, or that offense doesn't work because Jalen Hurts is reading that defensive end. If he crashes down, the quarterback has to pull the ball. If he doesn't, like what we saw with Gardner Minshew, the running game doesn't work as effectively. So you know, can they tell him, hey, just give the ball to the running back, but I think teams will be able to start keying on that, and now your running game is not going to be as effective. But there's an area this year – that I think they can start implementing into this offense, and you're already starting to see it in training camp, that could hopefully reduce the amount of runs, and that's going to be passes to the running backs out of the backfield, mm -hmm. especially DeAndre Swift. We saw last year Boston Scott, Kenny Gainwell, and Miles Sanders all combined for only 48 catches. DeAndre Swift had 48 catches by himself in Detroit. And the year before that, he had over 60 catches. And as a rookie, he had over 40 catches. So this is a guy who can catch the ball out of the backfield. So I think a way that this, the coaching staff can start to reduce these runs without completely changing that RPO style of offense is some short passes to your running backs. I'd love to see them get back to being a dominant screen team like they used to be under Andy Reid. We have such a athletic offensive line and now you put cam jurgens in at right guard a lot of people were concerned about his size is he too small well a way that you can really combat that is get him on the move get him outside run a little bit of a screen play some swing passes to your running backs he's a very athletic right guard we've seen how intelligent he is he reminds me a lot of jason kelsey that's why they drafted him so you put that athletic offensive line and we know how good lane johnson and jordan maialata are Start throwing a little bit more to your running backs. We've seen it in training camp, and I think that's a way to reduce the amount of carries Jalen Hurts has without really changing the essence of your offense. See, that's – I'm, like, refusing to let myself get caught up in any screen game hype, Bill, because I, last year it was the same type of thing. Miles Sanders was even talking about it. Kenny Gainwell was talking about it. It's like, oh, the screen could be coming back. Brian Westbrook, 63 yards against Washington. It's all that great stuff. I love, I, 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 love I, I, I love it. I love it too, but I feel like every single year we get teased with it. But the interesting point that you bring up is Cam Jurgens. Like, first of all, okay, yes. Uh, he reminds me, and I think it's okay to say, it's okay to say this, the same style as Jason Kelsey. Now, whether or not he's going to have a Hall of Fame career, I'll root for it, but I'm not betting on it. That's kind of hard to do. Yeah. But when it comes to his athletic ability and getting off the line of scrimmage and being able to make blocks downfield, I mean, Jason Kelsey, not only not only does he emulate Jason Kelsey in terms of style of play, Jason Kelsey literally helped recruit the guy. He uh, literally helped scout the guy. Hey, this guy kind of reminds me of me, so maybe take a look at him here. And, and I think he has a lot of those same traits. But him being on this offensive line and already – he hasn't been named it yet, but look, to your point, look at what they do, not what they say. He's the starting right guard of the Philadelphia Eagles for the 2023 season. So if he's going to be on the line of scrimmage and he's got that same type of mobility at a younger age, though, than Jason Kelsey right now, I think uh, Brian Johnson, I think Nick Sirianni, when he's game planning throughout the week, would be dumb to not incorporate it with this backfield, with DeAndre Swift, as you mentioned, 
and Kenny Gainwell, also a guy that can catch passes out of the backfield, and then two of those offensive linemen and Jason Kelsey and Cam Jurgens. Because, like, what's better than Jason Kelsey running down the field blocking on a screen? I'll tell you, two Jason Kelseys running down the field blocking for a screen. So maybe, with your point on Cam Jurgens, maybe this is the year I actually finally buy into the idea of the screen game making a triumphant return to the Philadelphia Eagles' backfield. That's what I'm hoping, too. That's what I'm hoping, too. But I really thought all offseason, it was a little overblown about Cam Jurgens' size. A lot of people say, oh, he's too small to play right guard. He's too small to play right guard. Tyler Steen's going to compete for that position. And like you said, it's really not a competition. They have not given Tyler Steen any first-team reps outside of when Cam Jurgens slides over to center to take some reps when Kelsey sits, just so that they can all get familiarity with different positions. But this is Cam Jurgen's job, and I know these football players list themselves a little bit differently. I did the same thing, always made myself a little bigger. <laughs> but Cam Jurgen's is listed at 302. Isaac Sayamala was listed at 304. So the way they're listed is not a drastic difference. I mean, when you look at them, the eye test tells you Sayamala is a little bit bigger. But these guys are so good at using leverage Cam Jurgens is so intelligent and strong and athletic that I was never of the, the mindset he's too small to play the right guard position. So I'm very confident in this offensive line. They're going to be a very athletic offensive line and a very intelligent offensive line. And you're putting Cam Jurgens. You mentioned Jason Kelsey is going to be a Hall of Famer. There's going to be another one to his right in Lane Johnson. So you're putting Cam Jurgens in between two future Hall of Famers. I think he's going to be just fine. All right, uh, let's have some fun before we end the uh, the the, the uh, second segment of the show here before the 9 o'clock break. Um, yesterday, Darius Slay interrupted the press conference with Brian Johnson, and he said, put me in a receiver, coach. Put me in a receiver. And apparently, Slay does this quite often. So looking at it like that, a couple of names got mentioned, and he was asked by our friend John McMullen about anybody else vying for touches that you might not expect. Of the names mentioned, Jalen Carter, fullback, at uh, Georgia there for a heartbeat. Uh, Jordan Mailata, obviously the rugby background. Darius Slay, Slay, just give me the ball and I'll take care of the business. And then this one, Fletcher Cox. <laughs> of those four names, Bill, who do you want to see get the football this year? And I, I'm not talking about fumble recovery. I'm talking about a planned, designed play. Who do you want to see get the ball? I don't think it's going to happen. But what I would <laughs> love to see is Jordan Maialata get the ball. You look at those highlights from when his Australian football days, if they just threw a little toss to him on the five-yard line, there's nobody stopping that guy. I, I would love to see them give a little toss to Jordan Maialata. I don't think you're going to see it. You know, And Slay can keep lobbying. Our receivers are too damn good to replace him with Darius Slay. Not that Darius Slay is not a great athlete, but you got A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard. We don't need Slay at that position. But the little toss to Jordan Maialata on the goal line to see what he could do with it, I'll sign up for that. See, here's the thing. I absolutely love the idea. Love the idea of tossing it out to Jordan Maialata in space. I'm not talking about a goal line. I'm like, I'm talking about like you're on your own 40-yard line. And let's just like, hey, have at it, son. They somehow run the bubble screen, pull him up as a tight end, pop him out there beside behind some uh, wide receivers. I don't know, but put a, put a running back out there too to block for him. I don't know. But I just love the idea of just seeing that man run. Now, for the record, the rugby tape that we've all seen, that was some years ago. He's put on some weight. He's a little bit of a bigger body guy. And I, I forget who it was with the Eagles. Maybe it was Dallas Goddard that said, you know, he put a big man out there running in some space. Guys are going to go after his knees, and we need him too bad at left tackle. So if I had to pick a, a number two guy to get the football – I do want to see Darius Slay get the ball. I mean, the, the idea of Fletcher Cox kind of being like a Warren Sapp tight end, right? Catching a touchdown would be cool. Doing the pogo dance, right? Yeah. But if you put Darius Slay in the end zone and the football in his hands in an offensive set, oh my. Could you imagine the sound bites after that game and what you've been hearing from Darius Slay? How much how much crap he'd be talking to A.J. Brown and, and, and uh, Devontae Smith and these guys about him getting in the end zone, catching a touchdown pass? Yeah, we would never hear the end of it. Never hear the <laughs> end of that one. Never hear the end of one. But you mentioned Jordan Maialata. That was some years ago. It's incredible what that guy has been able to do. Never playing football before. I mean, I'm so jealous of Jordan Maialata's skills in every aspect. 
not only did he learn how to play left tackle in an extremely short time and is playing at a high level in the NFL, the guy can also sing. I mean, what can he not do? You know, he's he's got more gifts, man. But uh, he just seems from all accounts like such a good dude, too. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Going back to that offensive line, you did mention the name Tyler Steen a while ago. Uh, Lane Johnson's the one that kind of put the quarter in that machine as far as there actually being a competition, because I think most people, Bill, were looking at it with the idea that Cam Jurgens was just going to slide right in there and play right guard. And that's exactly what's happened to this point. But looking at what Lane Johnson had to say, it was like, yeah, these two guys are very strong. These two guys are very committed to the playbook. They're very committed to studying. They're, there's going to be a battle. Both these guys are really strong guys coming in. The thing that's interesting is that Cam Jurgens has played in the phone booth before. Tyler Steen has not played in the phone booth before. We're talking about a guy that's been a tackle. In, in his college career, he has not played the guard position. The Eagles just went right ahead and drafted him as a guard. And I guess he's going to be the right guard of the future, but he's certainly not going to be the right guard of right now, especially with Jason Kelsey not retiring. Obviously, Cam Jurgen is going to be playing that right guard spot. When I look at Tyler Steen, I, I do question the idea. I do question whether or not he is ready to play the guard position, not just at the NFL level, but at any level, even if he was at the college position. Would he be able to play right guard? So, I mean, obviously it would be an easier transition for him at the college level, but is he not learning the playbook? Is he not digesting what Jeff Stoutland is trying to teach him at Stoutland University? Is he struggling with things in the early goings of this? Because for him, it's a much bigger transition than it is for Cam Jurgens. Yeah, you mentioned Stoutland University. I'm, I'm confident Jeff Stoutland will get him up to speed, but the question is how quickly. So you're right. Is there going to be a tough transition the, the reason that everybody was saying Tyler Steen projects more as a guard come out of college is because of his arm length. Scouts love arm length. So they want you to have those longer arms on the outside as a tackle. But in, in some respects, it's a little bit easier to go inside to that guard position because you are protected. On the outside, when he's playing the tackle position at Alabama, there's nobody protecting him around the outside, around the edge. So if he does slide in the guard, it's a little bit easier because you have people to your left and to your right. But I'm sure, like you were saying, learning this playbook, these blocking schemes are a lot more advanced. You need to know what you're doing, and you're learning a whole new position. So I do think you'll see some transition there. But hopefully Stoutland, we were just talking about Jordan Maialata. Look what Stoutland's been able to do with a guy who's never played at all. I'm confident he'll be able to get a guy who played tackle up to speed for guard when Kelsey retires. Hopefully it never happens, but it's going to happen soon. And you know, you hope Cam Jurgens can slide into that center position when it does happen. Tyler Steen steps right in and they don't miss a beat at right guard. But yeah, I agree with you. I think there's probably some some learning curve here that's preventing Tyler Steen from getting into that that battle with Cam Jurgens. Yeah, they haven't even gotten the, the first preseason game yet, but it feels like that battle is it's not even a battle. It's already just been decided. But the only reason I really bring it up isn't even for a preseason or position battle. It's for the fact the fact that during the course of the season, you see different guys in there. You see some, not a rotation necessarily, but injuries do happen, unfortunately. Nobody's rooting for it. Uh, but when it comes to the offensive line, they've had guys like Jack Driscoll that could just go in there and play. Even Andre Dillard turned himself into a decent backup, whether that be at the tackle position or that be a left tackle position with, uh, with Jordan Mailata. Forget about him just learning the position here at the pro level, but also going over to play right tackle as well. And then Andre Dillard actually becoming a decent guard. Now, he had guard experience in college, unlike Tyler Steen, but he went into that role, especially at the left guard spot last year, and filled in admirably at that spot. So I look at a guy like Tyler Steen, like if he is called upon to do so, to fill in for a game or two or anything long that, or longer than that, will he be ready to go? Are you confident? And I know everyone's confident in Jeff Stoutland, but each player is an individual. Each player is their own story. Are you confident that he will have learned enough and improved enough to be a starting guard on this team or really even a starting tackle on this team? They may not need him to be. You know, you still got Jack Driscoll on this team. So they have some depth at that offensive line. But we'll see. I mean, it's still extremely early. I'm hopeful. You never know with the Philadelphia Eagles and Nick Sirianni who you will see in the preseason games. But let's see what Tyler Steen looks like against other NFL talent and how he's progressing. I think it's a little early to say now if I have confidence in whether or not he could step in if someone goes down, but I'm looking forward to seeing him against other NFL talent this week. We'll see. Like I said, they don't play anybody, but I would think a guy like Tyler Steen is going to get a lot of reps, and we'll get a better understanding of how far along he is. But they do have some depth along that offensive line to be able to move 
move some people around. Mm -hmm. And then they just brought back uh, Stills, who yeah. was exonerated or found not guilty. Is that yeah, uh, yeah acquitted? Guy. Yeah, but yeah. So they'll have some depth there. We may not need to go to Tyler's team, but we'll see. I'm looking. That's one of the guys I'm really looking forward to seeing in the preseason game, along with those other rookies on the defensive side of the ball. Bill Calarulo, you have uh, something coming up here that not a lot of people have talked about, but we'll talk about it because it's a huge concern of yours that I know a lot of people aren't – they're letting it fly under the radar as of right now. We'll talk about that. Also, uh, at 920, we're going to be talking to uh, our friend Derek Gunn. He's going to preview what's coming up on Sports Take a little bit later in the show, a little bit later in the day here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. We'll talk to Gunner coming up at 920 today. But when we come back, a, uh, a concern that's flying under the radar for some people, but not you, Bill. You're sharp as a tack, my friend. We'll be back here with Bird uh, 365 coming up in a second.